First, I'd like to say thank you very much to the organisers for inviting me. It's been a fantastic conference so far. I really enjoyed it. Uh, the, the, the talks have been inspirational, uh, and now that it's my turn, just a little bit daunting. Uh, but bear with me. So I'm going to talk about uh, protein structure and, and function. I come from a, a protein structure classification background. So I work uh, with Professor Krishna Rengo uh, in the CAF uh, classification database. So I can just whiz through this stuff now, because you've had it in a much nicer version. We go from DNA sequence. We learned an awful lot about the DNA world yesterday. Uh, I'm going to drag you kicking and screaming into the uh, protein world now. So we get our amino acid sequence, which is this uh, linear string of amino acids. Uh, and then with this linear string, we find that this folds up into these secondary structures. Uh, secondary structures being these kind of alpha helices in red and these beta strands in yellow. Uh, and then these secondary structures then fold on themselves to form this uh, compact globular structure. So this is our protein structure. Uh, and to complete this, uh, this kind of trio, we have protein function. Uh, now, there is quite a lot already known about protein function. There's lots of uh, quite mature resources that try and uh, provide uh, information, allow people to provide information about function. I've put the question mark there because this is really a lot of what we do is about trying to predict function. So given a protein sequence, given a protein structure, using our information about how this all ties together, uh, we try and predict function. This is you know, obviously useful. Uh, so again, I can, I can whiz through this. Protein sequence, it is, you, know, you can infer a huge amount of information from protein sequences, especially when you have lots of them together. You can look uh, for kind of conserved patterns. Uh, and not coming from a sequencing background, uh, I was amazed to find out that, yes, it's, uh, apparently we can get an entire genome for under $1,000 on a handheld device. I mean, to me, this is like Star Trek stuff. Uh, but apparently, this is what it looks like. It's all very doable. Um, and this just means that we're going to have an avalanche of sequence information. On the other hand, as you've heard before, protein structure is a different kind of ball game. It's, it's, it's much harder to get hold of. Uh, we've already heard some of the trials and tribulations that people might have getting these crystals. Uh, and you know, maybe you'll be lucky at getting these crystals, and maybe you'll be unlucky at getting these crystals. Uh, but ultimately, you know, even if you are lucky, you've still got to find time with a synchrotron. All this kind of stuff is time consuming, expensive, uh, it requires resources. So why do we bother doing this? Well, I mean, uh, nature happens in three dimensions. Nature happens, you kind of need to know uh, what's going on uh, in, in, real, in real space to understand things like active sites of enzymes. So knowledge, detailed knowledge uh, of, of structure, so a really kind of high resolution, is, is really important when you're kind of looking to see how uh, enzymes work, uh, what an, an active site actually looks like. And you, and you really, really care about um, you know, the, the distances here. You know, we're not talking macro scale, we're talking absolutely tiny, tiny scale. So understand not just uh, how enzymes work, but also how to interfere with that. So in disease states, you might want to uh, know how to, to put a drug into that same spot. And you need to have a good idea about what, what that looks like in three-dimensional space. Uh, equally, on, uh, on this side, we have protein-protein interfaces. And this is another uh, sort of big area. Uh, in drug design, but also um, in evolution as well, understanding sort of this, this interface between these two proteins. And in order to kind of dock these two or understand how they dock together, you need to have an idea about uh, what they look like in 3D space. So that was a very quick intro. Uh, I, as I said, I, I'm from a structured classification background, so I'm going to kind of give you my take on it. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a bit of background uh, about that world. I go into some of the challenges that, uh, that we face and then hopefully uh, bring it together with uh, you know, our first initial attempts at uh, trying to provide some visualization tools. Uh, we've seen this graph, graph this morning. So this is the, the, the structures being deposited into this central repository, the PDB. Uh, so it started in the 1970s. Uh, around 20 years ago, it kind of exploded. Uh, so we had lots and lots and lots of structures coming in. At 1995, this is when uh, structural classification resources, CATH and SCOP, uh, came into being. This is when there was about well, less than 4,000 structures in the PDB. So people looked at these structures and, and said, well, they kind of, some of these share, uh, structures share similar structural features. Uh, and as we tend to do, we tend to group these things together to see if we can derive any meaning from that. Uh, just as a, sort of a, a milestone over in the sequence world, 
2000 was when the, the rough draft of the Human Genome Project uh, came out. And this brought in, well, it kind of marked a, a milestone that brought in a huge swathe of sequence data. Uh, and partially in response to that, uh, in 2002, a couple of years later, people looked at, well, our own groups looked at the structural classification knowledge that we had in these databases uh, and then used that knowledge to, uh, kind of applied that knowledge to all of the protein sequences to, to expand, uh, to, to expand uh, all of the information that we, can, uh, that, we, that we have in these structural classifications. So the structural classifications contain structures. Uh, people use that information. Uh, Gene3D built itself on CAF. Superfamily built itself on SCOP. Uh, they used use that information to uh, assign protein structures to predictions to all of the protein sequences. And this is where we are now. Uh, there are around uh, 80,000 protein structures. Uh, that, these numbers don't match up because these are all of the structures in the PDB. Around 80,000 of them are protein structures. Uh, and this compares to the 20 million odd uh, protein sequences. So something that I'll be talking about uh, is the idea of a structural domain. And this is very important in terms of the work that, that we do. So this is a, a typical protein sequence. Uh, if you look at this, it go from the, the N terminus here, right the way through this, this protein to the C terminus, uh, you'll notice that actually rather than just having a, a single blob, there, there are three distinct blobs that can be considered uh, as separate entities. And what we find is when, when you look at these distinct blobs, these kind of uh, independent folding units, you often find this red domain here uh, not just in this context, not just in this protein, but you often find this red domain in other proteins in different contexts as well. Uh, so this is important now. So we can consider this long line at the bottom. This is the, this is the protein. It's important to consider the, how the protein itself has evolved, but also how these independent folding units have, have evolved, because we find that these, they kind of chop and change during evolution. So these, these are like little Lego blocks, uh, and you kind of need to follow the evolution of these domains as much as the entire protein. So we take, uh, just whilst I'm here, we, we, this bottom representation there is a, uh, it's called a domain organization map or a multi-domain architecture. Uh, whatever name you give it, it's just a, a linear uh, sequence of where the structural domains lie on this protein. So we take these individual domains uh, and in, a, in our structural classification, we try and group them together. As at the very, very top level, we say, uh, how, what percentage of secondary structure does it have? Does it, is it comprised mainly helices or strands and so on? So this is the class. It kind of gives us a vague idea of where, uh, what type of structure it is. Within each class, uh, it's split up into different architectures where we're trying to see the, 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 the general composition of where these secondary structure elements lie in 3D space. There are about 40 architectures. It's deliberately too small for you, uh, for you, for you to worry about. Um, so if we take one of these architectures, this is the three-layer alpha-beta sandwich called because you have this alpha, beta, alpha in a sandwich. Um, if you start looking at the, the, the layer beneath the architecture, the topology, this, this is where we, we actually start caring about how these secondary structure elements are linked together. So these two cases here, these are separate topologies, although these structures may look quite similar. But if you start looking at um, how the, the secondary structures link through from right the way through the protein, and you follow that line right the way through, you can see in these topology diagrams that it's actually they're linked very, very differently, uh, which gives us strong evidence that they're not related by evolution. Uh, oh, yeah, so, so this, uh, this kind of work in terms of classification brought up a, a collaboration uh, with Richard Garrett, uh, who now works in the University of Sao Paulo, I think. Uh, this is a few years ago, but this is kind of a fun project that we were involved in. And this was trying to provide to structural biologists a kind of teaching tool, uh, teaching equivalent to the periodic table for chemists, which is a ridiculously lofty am ambition. Uh, but it was, it was good fun, and it kind of provides a nice idea of what's there in, in structure space. Just a kind of a nice uh, top-down visual idea of uh, what, what types of structures are available. Uh, with annotations of you know, what functions they're involved in, what organi organisms they're involved in, and so on. Uh, now, proteins don't really like to be tidied away into very neat and tidy little compartments, uh, as we found. So uh, originally, the you know, structure space looked something like this, where we had these nice little islands where we can kind of group protein structures together in our class architecture fold. 
But actually, as the, as the number of structures grew, we started getting lots and lots and lots of more variations in the structures that, that we could see. There are some areas of structure space that began to kind of overlap. So this kind of phenomena uh, in, in the kind of structure world is known as con the continuum, full continuum, uh, or in this case, architecture continuum, where it's, it's not really these kind of distinct clusters. Uh, and this, this idea of a, a continuum uh, uh, meant that sort of resources like say Dali originally, rather than providing these curated clusters, they would say, you have a structure that you're interested in, and these are all the structures that uh, look like it. So for a given structure, this is one of those structures that looks like it. You superpose them, you look at both of them. So in a way, it's providing you a tool to provide your own classification or your, your own curation. So this is an alternative to hierarchical classification. But I'm going to bring you back to, to, to Kath. Uh, so we, we, I spoke about these three levels. The, the one that's most important is this level, homologous superfamily. So this is, the, this is where we spend most of our time and energy, making sure that we get this bit right. Uh, and this is detective work. This is getting down, checking for sequence similarity, checking for structural similarity, looking at journals, all this stuff. And what we're doing is making sure that the structures that we group together in these superfamilies uh, are related by evolution. So there's strong evidence that these are all related by evolution. So you can kind of see intuitively that these structures all look very similar. But one thing to note with these structural superfamilies is that actually these, these structures can come from, they can be separated by billions of years of evolution. So uh, there can be absolutely no sequence similarity between these, two, uh, between these four structures. They've evolved beyond all recognition. Uh, yet they've retained this, this structural core, which clearly must be very useful for them to, to have retained that. So as a summary, domains within a uh, family they can be separated by billions of years of evolution and have absolutely no detectable sequence similarity. Uh, they can even perform a range of functions uh, during this, uh, this time. However, they share this conserved structural core, uh, and there's evidence to suggest that, that they are related by evolution. Now, I can give you a, uh, he says, hopefully, uh, if, I'm, if I'm lucky and the, and the wind goes with me, I can give you an idea of, uh, so this is a very simple superfamily, where we start off with uh, one structure in the superfamily, and we just superpose other structures on there. And you can see in this kind of very nicely well-behaved small superfamily, uh, you can see that the, the structure is very well conserved. Uh, I mean, there are regions of variation uh, that, may, that may be interesting for us to, to look at, but really this is kind of a nicely behaved superfamily. If only that were the case all the time. So moving on to uh, challenges. So one of the biggest challenges that we, that we face in this, uh, okay, at this point, in case anyone's considering of phoning the visualization police, uh, I should explain myself. My, my boss gave me this slide, honestly, my boss gave me this slide, and I told her at the time, if I bring a pie chart to a visualization uh, conference, then they may well throw me out. Uh, so you can imagine my relief, especially after this was mentioned yesterday, that I had, I had already changed this to, to somewhere else, but I thought I'd show that anyway. Uh, so th this, is, this is showing the distribution of where these structural domains come from. So these structural domains can be assigned to a superfamily uh, in terms of which domains are uh, related by evolution. But the distribution of where those structural domains come from is not evenly spaced within the superfamilies. So if these are all of the 60 million proteins that we know about, 60 million protein domains that we know about, and these uh, boxes there, represent each box represents a superfamily, and the size of the box represents how many domains are in that superfamily, then you can kind of see the, the 100 most populated superfamilies actually account for nearly 60% of nature. So dealing with these huge superfamilies is, is a big problem for us. And this is a, uh, a problem in processing, analyzing, and also visualization. And this is kind of a similar idea. This is a, a slightly less well-behaved superfamily. So this is a, one, of, one of our huge superfamilies called the HUPS, which we've studied in, in quite detail in our group. So again, we can start off with these structures and start superposing uh, our structures on top of each other. And immediately, you can already see there's a lot more structural variation. Uh, so, we, so, uh, yeah, so we can see all these, these bits at the, all these bits at the top and at the bottom. And whilst the computer struggles manfully to, to work its way through this animation, Hey. So 
despite the fact that there is lots and lots of variation, if you look carefully through the middle, you can still see this conserved core. This is now piling 70-odd um, structures together, 70-odd very, very diverse uh, structures together. However, still, uh, during this, this process of evolution, we can still see uh, inside, inside this uh, kind of structural hairball uh, to, to what's going on in here. And if we actually fade down all the structurally diverse areas, this becomes very, very compelling to say, uh, despite the fact that all these structures are very, very, uh, very, very diverse, we still, have, we still see this ancient structural core right the way through evolution. So these, these provide us with a huge amount of information. These kind of superfamilies provide us with a huge amount of uh, information, but they're also an absolute pain to deal with. Uh, and this is, this, is one of the, so this is one of the visualizations that we've only very recently been looking at in terms of how to get across the message of what a superfamily is within sort of three, four seconds. And actually, this bit here, uh, is probably the closest we've come to a single image that says this is a superfamily to, to people who haven't got a clue what it is. Please feel free to uh, let us know uh, if you have any better ideas. So uh, these, these huge, these huge superfamilies um, can be a problem to, to think about how we deal with this. Um, we, we can deal with it by splitting up, separating these big superfamilies into little chunks. And if we want to look at um, very sort of tight detail of what's going on in a particular function, then we'll create these sequence clusters. So the, these, these here represent sequence clusters where the big black line at the top is a known structure. So this is a, a protein with a known structure, and all the small lines underneath it uh, are, are sequences that we've managed to uh, match and align to that. So these are very kind of, uh, these, these are very tight. Ideally, there's only a single function uh, within these clusters. I haven't got time now to go through the methodology of how we do this, but the idea is that there's, uh, each of these clusters only performs a single function. Uh, the other side of this is uh, using structural information to, to, take, to take these and join them together, to go back a bit further in evolution and join them together. So here is, we, we have those sequence alignments with their, with their representative structure. Then we can use this structural alignment here to, to piece those sequence alignments together and give us this broader view of what, of what happened beyond the point where, you, where sequence becomes impossible to, to start using sequence as a, as a, as a, way, uh, as a way of analyzing evolution. So well, one uh, resource that we've been involved in as a collaboration with Janet Thornton and Nick Furnham at the EBI, uh, we've been involved in this resource, Funtree, which takes uh, those alignments that get generated uh, and annotates them. Now, Funtree is a great resource. It provides loads and loads and loads of, uh, sort of tools to allow people just to start browsing. Um, and it, we, we, try and, we try and annotate everything. So uh, the, the, these aren't um, kind of hand curated stuff. These are finding automated tools that will annotate as much as we possibly can do in a meaningful way. Uh, and we've been using these uh, in-house in, in, for our own research. So here we have uh, one of our domains, which is a RNA, well, it's involved in um, RNA synthetase. Uh, and this, if you look at the structure of this, this domain and highlights residues that we know are very, very important in terms of how highly conserved they are during evolution. So the, the, the residues in red, uh, we know are very, very well conserved, so they must be very important. Uh, if we highlight these residues, then you can kind of see that this bit here must be important, and it looks like it's a binding cleft. Something's probably going to fit into that hole there. Um, if we turn that structure around, you see you, do, you don't really see any patterns of conservation. Now, if we do the same thing for, uh, for this entry down here, this is a related domain. So this is another synthetase, but it comes from E. coli. It's, it's uh, binding a slightly different substrate. Again, we have a similar pattern of highly conserved residues in this uh, same binding site, but across the other side of the binding site, if you can see that, um, we, we also see this another, pa another patch emerges on the surface of this protein, which would suggest that for, for whatever reason, that patch may well be uh, of interest. So maybe that indicates another binding site that's important for the function of this protein. So hopefully we're, we're, you know, we're very much hoping that these tools may be used to, to suggest further avenues of research. Um, uh, one other uh, big challenge that we have is these these sequence, family, uh, sequence alignments can be huge, absolutely huge. So um, I probably haven't got time to go into what a sequence alignment is. You, I'm sure you're all very familiar with this. We're kind of lining up the, the amino acids to kind of see common chemical properties 
uh, in, in the best possible way. And by doing that, we're looking for um, kind of regions of conservation. So the, the problem is that these sequence alignments end up looking, looking like this. Uh, and it's, when they get to a certain size, they start to lose biological meaning uh, as much as uh, become very, very difficult to process. So one way around that we, we've approached is to, is to rather, than, rather than having these alignments, which essentially contain lots and lots and lots of proteins that uh, are sorted effectively randomly, is we, we, sort, we put the, the, the protein sequences that are most interesting, that have the most interesting features to the top of the list. So this is a really, really simple idea, that uh, of, of all the sequences here, the ones that are interesting, the ones that, say, have a known structure associated with them, or the ones that uh, provide a representative of a particular domain organization, or the ones that have some functional annotation from Go or EC. How am I doing? We, we okay for time? We're cool. Thank you. So we try and provide representatives to, to show as much of this information as possible uh, at the top of this alignment. And then after we've got all those bits in the, in the alignment, we kind of go through just the, the tree of life to say, starting at the center of the tree of life and just working our way out, we start all reordering these sequences to provide exactly the same alignment, just reordered with the kind of interesting stuff at the top. Which means for things like uh, web applications where we necessarily have to draw a cutoff because you literally cannot stick 10,000 sequences on a web page meaningfully. It means that we can um, just say, okay, we're going to by default show the, the top 500, and hopefully that will catch most people's interest for what they want to look at. If they then want to sit and wait for a 10,000 uh, sequence alignment to download, uh, then that's up to them. Uh, there may well be more sophisticated ways of doing this. There may well be more sophisticated um, uh, browsers uh, that, that this becomes um, unnecessary. But this is something that we've, that we've had to do. So just as a, as a summary of the, of the kind of challenges, uh, dealing with these huge, huge superfamilies, these big superpositions, um, visualizing them uh, in an in a intuitive way, dealing with these uh, big sequence alignments. Um, from a developer's point of view, uh, I would certainly, and this is uh, also from the, the breakout, breakout group that we had yesterday, is, uh, I found very interesting. I'm certainly in, interested in tying all these different uh, modules together uh, ideally, web-based modules together to, to provide these sequence alignments and structural viewers. And obviously, there are some fantastic tools out there that people have spent years and years and years developing. Um, and it would be it would be great to to know the best way of of tying these things together, uh, having a common language to talk about um, sequences and proteins in the same way that BioJava, Bio Bio uh, Python, BioPerl uh, have their own language. It'd be nice to have the uh, have a similar thing for uh, JavaScript and HTML5. Uh, D3 has been mentioned lots and lots and lots, and that's something that um, I've uh, loved working with. So, uh, so uh, we, I've got a few minutes to to show uh, the, our first attempts, and I'm, really these are our first attempts. And I'm I'm throwing this out here because I'd love to get comments, criticism, and the rest of it. So this is our, this is the the CAF website, and the idea, like uh, a lot of uh, a lot of other resources, is to start off with your sequence. Somebody comes in, they have their sequence that they know may well be important. They just want to know a bit more about, about it. So with your amino acid sequence, you can search against the, the CAS uh, database, and you'll get a series of hits. So this is, uh, I mean, we've already uh, seen um, similar examples uh, where you, you show the, these kind of structural domain hits on, uh, on your protein, and then we can show some information, uh, information about that. So here we're showing which superfamily we think these areas might, might match to, and also which uh, functional family, which fun family uh, these, these areas map to. Uh, and we can start trying to suggest possible functions for their sequence. So hopefully people get to something they might find useful as quickly as possible. If we look at the, the superfamily pages, uh, we're trying to design a, a dashboard to allow people to see a good summary of information as quickly as possible. Um, and providing things like these uh, superpositions, uh, which uh, at the moment we have these downloaded as Pymol, but um, uh, I'm very happy to, to uh, I'm, uh, very happy to uh, add lots more. Uh, we also provide things like this um, uh, species browser. So this is looking through the taxonomic tree, so people can see which type of species uh, they're, they're, uh, the, the rest of the domains in this superfamily come from. Um, and again, the nice thing about developing in, in D3 is that it's pretty easy to get to this stage, and it's also fairly easy to, to add, drag, drop 
Zoom uh, functionality to it. Uh, so for guys who haven't already started working on D3, then it's, uh, it really is a, a nice tool to use. Um, when I mentioned before about kind of looking at these active sites, we've, we've tried to, to at least start getting on this, uh, to, uh, allowing people to get to this idea in their research. So here we, we're showing uh, somebody takes a sequence, they search against cath, they get brought to this page, and then they can start looking at the, the, the structure, the structural information that we know about that match. And here, again, in, in green, we've highlighted the uh, conserved residues, the residues that are really highly conserved for this structure. Uh, and you can kind of see that these residues uh, happen to, to come around this, what looks like a, a binding pocket. And uh, what, what, something that we need to do now is to map this information back onto the original sequence. Uh, but this is, hopefully this is something that will be useful to, to biologists and suggest avenues of further research. Um, a, a collaboration that we, we've been involved in uh, that I thought I'd mention is the, uh, the Genome 3D project, which uh, is slightly unfortunately named now. Um, but th this is talking about uh, uh, predicting protein structural domains onto genomic sequences. Uh, I can take no credit or blame for naming the project. Uh, so this, this, this idea is gathering together a lot of uh, resources that predict protein structural domains. Uh, so we have a particular uniprot sequence and we're predicting these features from um, a load of different resources to, to try and get an idea of you know, a consensus prediction. Uh, and in some cases, these predictions uh, aren't just start and stop. They aren't just, we think there's a protein here and it looks like this. Uh, they actually provide three-dimensional coordinates. So this is people uh, providing uh, predicted structures for uniprot sequences. And again, hopefully this is something that will, uh, that will grow and be useful. So I think uh, I'm done. Uh, I want to say uh, a big thank you to Christine Arango, my boss. Uh, please don't tell her what I said about the pie charts, obviously. Uh, also, the other guys that work, in the, the CATH team. Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, Ali Cuff is the person that does all that detective work. Uh, Tony is my partner in crime who's here today. Uh, he's uh, the guy who's done a huge amount of work, including those uh, beautiful animations. Um, the rest of the CATH team uh, and the guys that, that we have worked in, in collaboration, all funded by uh, BBRSRC and Welcome. Uh, and a mention for all of these projects uh, that people would spend their lives working on uh, for nothing to, to make our lives easier. Uh, thanks very much to all those guys involved. Uh, and thanks for your listening.